know how to convey this message that New York City is going to stand by them, that we continue to fight alongside our allies, like our Attorney General Tish James, and that they have the information to know exactly what's going on to clear up the confusion that I think that this administration in Washington has intentionally perpetuated. So I'm proud of this bill. Um, thank you, Mr. Speaker, for allowing us to, to really push ourselves to make sure that we're taking care of every single New Yorker. Congratulations, Carlina. That is today's stated uh, agenda. I'm happy to take any questions first on topic on these bills. Will. How do you define blame? Uh, what did they say? Because I this is the first I've heard of it. And that's not my understanding. I mean, my, uh, the staff has had conversations with that organization and with the advocates that have been involved. Councilmember Torres put this bill forward. I believe we had a hearing on this bill. It goes through the legislative process. These are complicated issues. Uh, and so we continue to look at it, but I'm not holding the bill up. It, like everything we do here, has to go through a rigorous process with the committee staff, with the attorneys, and with the bill sponsor. So uh, I'm happy to continue to, to talk about it. And, I'm not holding the bill up. I mean, that's the first I've heard of that. So I'd be surprised if the group that we're working with is saying that, but that's how you, that's how you said that they're saying it. So I want to go back and check and see. Yeah, I'm not blocking the bill. And it's going through the legislative process. Any other questions, Jeff? have um, a count, but it's, it's relatively small. Um, and they, we thought it was important to include them because they are quite vibrant and viable. And um, they meet the criteria of being able to, you know, seek procurement from the city. So while they're not huge in number, they are, are very vibrant and, and vital parts of the community. And um, we thought it was time to include them. Um, I, I can get you um, that information. Jeff, do we know the number? We can get it. We'll get you the number, Jeff. Any other on-topic questions? Okay, off-topic. Joe. Well, I think it's important to first provide a little bit of context. When the council acted on this and passed the local law that um, we are likely going to repeal, uh, there was no state action on protecting people from the harms of so-called conversion therapy. And because you had a Republican state Senate that would not move an assembly and Senate bill that had existed for a long time, I believe the council under the previous speaker and Councilmember Drum wanted to real show leadership and protect people given that the state wouldn't act. Now that we have a Democratic State Senate, you saw as one of the first bills they passed earlier this year, the statewide bill which has stalled for a very long time. The state has the ability to regulate medical licenses, the city does not, so we uh, before tackled it from a consumer protection angle and now that the state has the law on the books, um, we want to ensure that we are not uh, at harm for legal challenge 
not just for ourselves, but also setting up a national precedent which could undermine these laws all across the country. We want to be on the offensive nationally. And so LGBT civil rights organizations, legal groups, approached us in the last few months, and they made this request to us, saying we feel like it's duplicative now. There is a state law on the books which mirrors other laws from around the country that they've been seeking to pass, and they asked if we would be open to uh, repealing this. I really struggled with it. I really struggled with it because I don't want to look like we're retreating in the face of an organization that brought this lawsuit that has been deemed a hate group by the Southern Poverty Law Center. So I didn't want to look like we were wa waving the white flag to them. At the same time, I do understand the arguments from these uh, legal advocacy groups who said, even though you don't want to give in, you could be potentially undermining a lot of the work we're doing nationally. And now that there is a state law on the books that protects minors, it is not worth having this fight. Let's be on the offensive, uh, let's be on the offense in other places and not on the defense in New York, given that you passed a bill earlier this year. So that provides a lot of, it was painful, it was difficult, I struggled with it, um, but ultimately I think this is the responsible, strategic, and right thing to do. Oh, no. No, no, I don't think it reflects poorly on people who drafted the law. I mean, there was a decision, again, that was made that given there was an absence of uh, state action on this, that we wanted to protect uh, people in New York City. And that is why this was done, and we found a creative way to try to do that outside of the purview of medical licenses, taking, at, taking a look at it from the consumer protection angle. So um, I, I think the council showed leadership here. Sometimes we do that when we don't have exact particular uh, authority in the way we might exactly want it. We think about other ways to actually handle it. We try to be creative. If you look at what we did just about a year ago on speed cameras, that was a novel way to try to solve an issue where there was state inaction. The council stepped up, got an executive order from the governor to try to facilitate getting the cameras turned back on. It's sort of similar in that way. I can't think of another time that the council has repealed a bill, not uh, at least while I've been in the council. I'm sure we could have some of the lawyers here give you potential instances in the past uh, from the general counsel's office, but uh, not in the last uh, almost six years since I've been on the council have I seen us do this. And that's why I was so uh, reticent to do it, but on the advice of every major LGBT legal civil rights organization asking us to do this, that is what drove us to this position. Can I just ask you a follow-up question? Sure. Um, well, tell me your name, sorry. I'm okay. That's right. Well, most of the, you should, I mean, I, uh, I'm not the foremost expert on this, but the folks that have been working on this issue, uh, Matthew Shurka wanted to be here today. He's one of the leading advocates. He was someone that sadly had to go through conversion therapy for years as a minor and is now an outspoken survivor trying to pass these bills across the country. He's in Israel. He wasn't going to be here today to talk about this to the press, uh, but he's available by phone. I mean, what, what the advocates say is that the bills that uh, they are trying to pass in states across the country conform to what the New York state law was. And so they were not opposed to us taking the action that we took in 2017 in the absence of state action. Uh, but now that we got the state action, which protects young people, those are the type of bills they're pursuing. For adults, it's a little more tricky. I still think that uh, you know this practice is inhumane and misleading and damaging and destructive and wrong, but at the same time, uh, adults, uh, after they're not a minor anymore, can sort of make the decision themselves without a parent being involved whether or not they want to engage in what I think would be a very harmful thing to get up involved with. So that is sort of the distinction we see here, and that's why the state bill was done with these advocates and modeled in a way that they're working on in other parts of the country. Will.
We have a pretty rigorous vetting process here at the council. Um, I think the staff here does a fantastic job uh, vetting uh, thousands and thousands of applications every single year. Um, and sometimes things uh, slip through the cracks. Um, you know, and we've tried to tighten that up. So since that story came out uh, about a year ago or so, uh, we actually strengthened our vetting process here at the council, taking in more factors that we wanted to look at. We hired additional people to work on the vetting team, given that it's just an enormous amount of vetting that has to happen annually. I'm not gonna get into all the specifics. I'm happy to have Jen speak with you uh, separately about exactly sort of what those standards are, what we look at, happy to get into that we're very transparent about it uh, and I think we do a really really good job given that we're allocating to thousands if not tens of thousands of groups every single year and very very few actually sift through the cracks like this so I'm really proud of the work that the staff does um, I, I think you know this already but I'm happy to explain it publicly the way it works for every single council member who's here every year they put together I did it before I was speaker you put together a list of items both on the expense side on local organizations social service groups that are important to you in your district or in your borough or in the city, and you submit a list to the Speaker of the City Council saying, would you be open to funding this group to do this important work? Then there's a separate list on capital, schools, parks, libraries, affordable housing developments, NYCHA, you submit that list to the speaker. We get, you know, thousands of requests from members. It goes through a vetting process, and ultimately, uh, that's my name in a transparent way is on with the member on the things that the member didn't fund from their own pot of money, but were funded from the speaker's list of money, which is a citywide list that we, uh, that we fund for members' districts all across the city. This project, I believe, I haven't read your story yet, but this project, I believe, is a project where there was a gap regarding a prevailing wage law, and to fill that gap and get this, I think it was 100% affordable building or a big percentage affordable, over the finish line, they need a certain amount of capital money to get it through. That's why the request was made. That's, I believe, why we granted, I don't remember the application. Again, there are like thousands that come in from every single member, but I think that is sort of how we got to where we are. And it's standard practice. We haven't changed anything. We strengthened the vetting process, but the disclosure on the speaker's name, whether it's Speaker Johnson, Mark Viverito, Quinn, Miller, Vallone, that's how it always ends up there. So I'm not deviating from that practice. It's not like I decide my name goes down. This is the process in place. It's always been that way. It's transparent for the public and the press so you know how these allocations get made. Yeah, I'm open to having a look at that. I mean, we've already strengthened, I believe it was Council Member Kalos had a bill that said that anyone who was on, doing, on the di doing business list, if they bundled money, that money would not get matched anymore, and the council passed that bill. Uh, we've strengthened the Campaign Finance Act in a myriad of ways, and we continue to build on it. So I would be open to it. Um, I'm proud that for a potential candidacy in 2021, even though the legal limit's $2,000, I'm not taking more than $250 a person. I'm not taking money from real estate developers. I'm not taking money from lobbyists who, who work at lobbying firms. And I've done that uh, on my own, a self-imposed way to try to sh show that everything we do here is above board and I'm not being influenced by anyone who's giving money. And we want to ensure that the public has uh, real confidence in their elected officials. So if there's a way to strengthen it, I'm open to looking at it. I think we've strengthened it in good ways so far. Uh, but if there are other ways to do it, I'm not sure if there's a bill in the council to do that yet. Uh, but I'm always happy to have that conversation to strengthen it. Tell me your name. Gwen. Yeah. Gwen. Oh, good to see you. Yes. Yeah. The 
This is the news that Andy Byford announced today at the Fulton. Uh, I, I haven't heard any details about what those uh, officers are gonna be used for, but I would say that I think there are other potential things to invest money in, uh, which are uh, social workers and investing in people who have, investing services in people who have serious uh, mental illnesses that need to be treated. I think those are some of the things we should be focusing uh, the money on getting to the root cause of those problems. And again, I have been someone that has uh, talked about the fact that I think that we should move away from over policing, broken windows policing, and what that does to communities. Now, we do have a major, major, major epidemic of homelessness in the city, and you see it, I think, acutely on the subways and on street corners across the city. And that is why one of the things we just funded in the budget that we just passed a few months ago is, and it's a small step in the right direction, setting aside 100 beds for people who are seriously mentally ill to divert them from being on Rikers Island to get them the long care and long-term treatment that they need. I am not saying that every homeless individual or everyone's on the subway uh, has mental illness, but a, a significant number of them do. And we want to ensure they get the treatment and help that they really, really need. So I have given the details on these 500 officers, uh, I, I think that we, we, we understand now that what happens if you over police, uh, you get mass incarceration, and uh, we're trying to move away from that in New York City, uh, but I need to understand from the MTA and Andy Byford how exactly they plan on deploying those 500 officers, but my immediate take on it is I think there are probably better things to invest in. Rich? I'm not sure about the, what do you mean on the last part? Keep the ridership safe. Well, the MTA and the individual board provide money to serve this community. Yeah, yeah. The, the government has, has raised their abatement as one of the key causes of life issues in the subway. So I'm asking you, do you share the same hopes that I am also asking you, uh, do you share the MTA's belief about the future of rider safety? I just was, can, I just don't understand the last part of the question. On rider safe, do you mean just sort of safe generally or safe from people on the subway that? From people that shouldn't be there. Got it, got it. I wasn't sure what exactly meant on that. Um, on the first part, uh, I do think we, um, we want people to pay the fare. And one of the things that I'm really proud this council did was, uh, you know, in the first six months of this uh, new body starting, we got fair fares, which is to help low-income New Yorkers that are struggling to pay the fare, half price fares for New Yorkers that are living below the federal poverty line. And so many of the people that are uh, uh, evading the fare, not paying the fare, are people that can't afford it. You, you, it's, it's heartbreaking to walk into the subway and to see uh, a, a young mother uh, begging for a swipe with their uh, small child to get on the subway. And so I think, you know, it's a, if you, it's a, it's a uh, issue of people not having the money in many regards. Now there are some people who can afford to pay the fare and the door is left open and they're walking through the door and that is a problem. Those people should be paying. But I think we need to be uh, commensurate with the uh, penalty we put in place. When someone is you know, caught uh, speeding or breaking traffic laws in New York City, many times they don't get, they don't get arrested, even if they kill someone with their car they don't get arrested. But if someone jumps a turnstile, they could get arrested right on the spot. We need to make sure these things are actually balanced in a fair way so that we're not overly criminalizing poor people in New York City. I think we do need to work on fair evasion, but I'm not sure we need to use a hammer. We need to be thoughtful about how we go about it. On the issue of, of safety, I'm not exactly sure what, what you're getting to. I mean, there are, you know, six million people who take the subways and buses every single day. We saw a report 
of the number of assaults against MTA workers have gone up dramatically, which is very, very disturbing. Where we want to ensure that conductors and bus drivers and people that are doing this work are treated, are treated with respect and are not being assaulted or mistreated in any way. Uh, and we want to ensure that everyone who's on the subways feels safe, but it's a big system. A lot of people take it every day. Uh, you know, I think, of course, it's not the same as it was in the 1980s and the 1990s. We're in a much different world and city than we were then. We can always improve. So, uh, sort of generally, that's what I'd say about the subway experience. But, but then, you know, you don't I don't know what he's talking about. I need to know specifically when he talks about safety concerns. What does that mean? Well, I just spoke about fare evasion, and you know anyone who rides the subways and uh, it has to deal with, you know, uh, a tragic case of someone who is chronically homeless sleeping on the subway, having all of their goods on the subway. It's heartbreaking, and also uh, it's not the appropriate place that they should be. We need them in support of housing. We need them to actually have a roof over their heads, and that's where we should be focusing our resources. Uh, you know, if you're talking about some of the things like when you get into the subway in the middle of the summer and the air conditioning's not working, you know, that's a big issue. And that is why I have called for municipal control of the subways and buses so that we could actually have accountability to one person. I laid out in a plan what it would take instead of having this opaque MTA board with board members that most members of the public can't name who they are and a budget that is very confusing. So I think these issues are nuanced. Uh, it's not really a sort of a soundbite answer, but I think you need to talk about about the broader issue structurally at the MTA and what we need to do to improve the MTA in the short term and in the long term. Uh, let, me, let me go to someone else. I'm happy to come back. Gloria. Yeah. No, they haven't uh, told me that, but I think this organization that has been bringing these lawsuits forward have been trying to figure out which laws across the country they, th they thought they think they should challenge. I haven't gotten any indication that the state law that was passed earlier this year is one of those laws. I still wanted to ask you about the vaping. Um, the, uh, vaping, yeah. Yep. Um, the yep. No, we haven't considered that. I don't think that's the right course of action because ultimately you need to weigh these things. And when you weigh the fact that a menthol flavored e-cigarette may potentially help an adult who is quitting smoking, that same uh, weight you're giving to that may be uh, making it easier for a child or a teenager to get addicted to actually vaping, which could lead them to cigarette use and puts them in that cycle. So we have not had conversations about that carve out. Again, I'm about 140 something days off of smoking cigarettes. I was smoking a pack a day of Parliament 100s. The hardest thing I've ever done was quit cigarettes, much harder than quitting alcohol and uh, drugs. Uh, and I think one of the things that has helped me has actually been uh, vaping, but I'm actually not proud of it. Uh, I want to actually quit vaping. I think it's a short-term thing that's hopefully helpful to me, a bridge to finally being fully nicotine-free. Uh, and I do think it's an option that's out there for some people that has worked for them to keep them from not returning to cigarettes. But you have to balance these things against what is happening with the targeting and marketing towards minors and young people in New York City and across the country. And that's the thing that we're trying to balance here. And that is what I think we need to prioritize. And that is why I am supportive of the bill to ban e-flavored 
cartridges and packets and cigarettes across New York City. And uh, you know, we're gonna, we have, now we have to study exactly what the FDA is doing in wake of the Trump administration's announcement yesterday and the HHS secretary's announcement and the FDA commissioner's announcement. We have to see exactly what they're doing, but um, I think this is a good thing to move in this direction. We wanna protect young people and minors in New York City. You know, Councilmember Cabrera has a bill to do just that, and I believe the number of sponsors has gone up recently. And so he's been making uh, his case to colleagues in the body. It's something that I'm open to. Um, I think this issue is a little more tricky, uh, only because not to stereotype or generalize. I think a lot of menthol cigarettes predominantly, not exclusively, have been uh, used by African Americans in New York City. And some people say that if you ban menthols, you're j basically just making it harder for potentially African Americans who through their own choice decide they wanna smoke those type of cigarettes. What does that mean? What does that mean to, uh, you know, uh, are people gonna try to get those type of cigarettes another way? So I think we have to think of those, but ultimately I think it's a health decision as well. The MWACP has come out in favor of Councilmember Cabrera's bill. We've been talking to them, working with them and other advocates. So this is the process we're going through, but I feel like you know, uh, if there's an opportunity to make significant progress on this, we should uh, strike while the iron's hot and, and, and get something done that's gonna protect as many people as possible. Smoking, I think, is at an all-time low in New York City. It may have ticked up a little bit last year, but we're still at an all-time low, and we should keep pushing it lower and lower and lower, and that is what I think these bills would achieve. Uh, Michael. I agree with Dan. When Dan and I worked on this bill together in 2016, I thought that's what was gonna happen when we enacted the bill. And it, yeah, I thought it was gonna happen in the, I believe in the law it's called the designated activity zone. Yeah. So in the DAS, uh, where it's just painted areas throughout the pedestrian plazas in Times Square, I believe that everything you just uh, delineated, Michael, where the approach is made, the, uh, the haggling begins, the posing happens, the picture gets taken, I believe that was all gonna happen in the DAS, in the designated activity zone. And so um, I think we need to fix this if there's a loophole. Um, I haven't seen the exact language of the new bill, uh, but I know the staff has been working on it and it's something that we should clarify so that people don't have to go through this. Uh, it's awful what happened to that 14 year old girl in Times Square. I'm grateful that the NYPD was able to act quickly. Um, and so I think we need to actually clarify this and also to provide a 
historical context. This does not mean in any way making excuses for bad behavior or people acting inappropriately or uh, preying on people, but also we wanna be uh, careful about how we do this just because so many of these uh, folks, not all of them are bad, not all of them are breaking the law. There are some really bad actors that are in Times Square doing this on a daily basis. We wanna actually do enforcement on those folks. But for the other folks, a lot of them are uh, low-income immigrants. A lot of them are people that are struggling to make ends meet, and we wanna make sure that they know the rules, they abide by the rules, I think most of them will, and they're able to do it in a very clear way to continue to make a living, uh, but also respect tourists and New Yorkers that are going through that area in a way that they're not gonna have to deal with unwanted attention or touching. That's what we wanna make sure happens. So we've been, we've, no, I'm happy to have Bradway and we've been working, uh, Brad has a, Brad Lander, Councilman Lander has a great bill called the uh, Reckless Driver Accountability Act, which would attempt to get some of these drivers that have multiple infractions off the road um, and for the city to be able to take proactive action to get those cars uh, either uh, have them, uh, you know, not be able to be used. So. It's been a little more tricky and complicated than we realize because of state law that governs a lot of uh, vehicles and the, the vehicle laws that are on the state books. We've been looking at that. Uh, Brad and I have been talking a lot about this. I feel very confident we'll have movement on it soon. Brad sadly had to live through that Dorothy Bruns tragedy in his district, right outside his district office. So I'm happy to have him talk about it. Yeah, thank you, uh, Corey. Now, and each one of these is like really just um, soul crushing. I, you know, the part of how I got into caring about this so much was when Sammy Cohen Eckstein, who was 12 at the time, was killed on Prospect Park West, and then the two kids killed by Dorothy Bruns, and this one was not in my district, but another 10-year-old. And um, I, you know, and so I introduced now about a year ago this Reckless Driver Accountability Act. We then had to wait for the state. You know, we were in that period when we did not have the authorization of the red light cameras. So we did an emergency hearing that included that bill last August. Um, but we had to wait until like April when the speed cameras got reauthorized in Albany to pick it up and start doing the research. Um, I had a series of five meetings with uh, the speaker's staff and with the administration. I, I gave a excessive amount of detail in a streets blog post about the each issue we're looking at. Uh, seizure is complicated, preemption is complicated, due process, but we have to get there. And I just like, as I you know posted the other day, like I just don't feel like any of us have done enough. Um, we've done a lot of work on street redesign, but not on reckless driving and identifying the most reckless drivers and getting a policy uh, intervention in place to get them to change their behavior or get them off the road before they injure or kill our neighbors and our families. The cameras give us new data we did not have before. Previously, you couldn't really, there was no way of figuring out who are the sociopathically reckless drivers. The expansion of the red light and speed camera program means we can see who the people are who are super reckless and intervene with them, and we're gonna continue to do the work together um, to get uh, uh, the Reckless Driver Accountability Act passed, and I hope also to look more broadly at things we can do uh, to focus on the issue of reckless driving and reckless drivers and make more interventions to keep people from getting injured and killed. And this year, you know, has been so awful and tragic with, uh, we're up to 20 cyclist fatalities uh, surpassing all of last year and pedestrian fatalities are up 20% as well. I mean, a lot of these cyclist fatalities, uh, I'm, I'm glad they're getting the coverage to make sure there's action, but not every pedestrian fatality gets the coverage day in and day out and pedestrian fatalities are up 20% in New York City and most people walk around New York City if they're not driving and so we wanna make sure that everyone is safe. It is heartbreaking and as Brad said, soul crushing and tragic that this 10 year old boy was killed yesterday. We want to make our streets safe and livable uh, for all New Yorkers. And that is what Brad's bill is about. That is why we have the master plan bill that I believe we're going to be able to move soon on requiring ad additional safety upgrades across New York City with benchmarks, real benchmarks, and we have to keep pushing. Yes. Uh, 
Um, you know, one thing that I've said over and over and over again from when I believe the mayor announced he was running in May was that if you are mayor of New York City, it is a lot more challenging for you to run for president than anyone else who's running for president because you have a lot more day-to-day -day responsibility. You have to talk about the schools and safe streets, and you have to interact with the city council and the state legislature and the governor and everything that's happening in New York City. And uh, so I think it's a real challenge that he's had to face ever since the beginning. You know, he saw it, uh, and, and he didn't know what the timing was gonna be, but you saw it when the blackout happened. He was just uh, serendipitously in Iowa at the time, uh, and he wasn't here. And so these things happen if you're gonna be out of town and you're gonna run for office. I mean, I think that is a challenge that he's faced that no one else has faced. I'm gonna watch the debate tonight. Uh, I'm glad it's only gonna be one debate and not two debates, so only 10 people on stage, not over two nights. Uh, and, you know, I've still interacted with the mayor. I still talk to the mayor. I saw the mayor yesterday at Ground Zero for the very somber 9-11 ceremony, and then I saw him in Staten Island last night with Councilmember Rose at the postcard ceremony on the North Shore in her district, uh, remembering the over 300 Staten Islanders who were lost, and the mayor was at both of those. So I think he continues to uh, you know, work on these issues, but it's also probably distracting to try to run for president and balance the responsibilities of being mayor of New York City. Rich. I said how I felt. I mean, I, I think no, no, I said, I said well, we're weighing it. It's complicated. It's nuanced. It's going to go through the process. We're talking to the staff. We're talking to the advocates. We're working with Councilmember Cabrera. Those are the different factors that we're looking at. I tried to give a very nuanced. I'm, we're trying to work through those issues. So when we work those issues, it's going through the legislative process. As things go through the process, I get educated, I work with the sponsor, I've been working with Councilmember Cabrera on this, he'll tell you we've been talking about it a lot, I've been working with the advocates, so we're working on it. I don't have a firm position yet, but I feel like we are heading in a very good direction. I feel like we're working through some of the issues that have been raised by folks that had some concerns, so I feel good about the direction we're heading in, I feel positive about it, and as I said to Gloria, I think we need to continue to ensure that we keep as many people smoke-free in New York City as possible. I say that as a chronic former smoker that still struggles with staying nicotine-free. To me, it's personal. I know how deadly and addictive these things are, and I take it very, very seriously. And before I was elected speaker, even when I was a chronic smoker, I chaired the health committee and we passed a series of landmark bills. Councilman Berlander had a bill banning cigarettes from being sold in pharmacies. I used to buy my cigarettes at a Duane Reed, and we passed that bill because it's the right thing to do. So we're gonna continue to push the envelope and try to protect as many people as possible. That bill is still going through the legislative process and I'm gonna continue, gonna continue to work with the sponsor and the advocates and the staff to hopefully get to a good place on it. That's what I just, yes. I think it's a concern we've heard, not just from him, but from other folks as well. And I think that's something we have to work through. I don't think that is a barrier to getting to the right place on this. And I think you have the NAACP who doesn't agree with that. So, you know, the NAACP has been real leaders on what happened in the wake of Eric Garner's tragic death on Staten Island and their support Councilman Cabrera's bill, which I think tells you a lot about his bill. And so uh, I continue to work with Dr. Hazel Dukes, as does Councilman Cabrera, on this issue. We're talking to her, we're working with her, and there are other uh, uh, groups led by people of color in New York City who support this bill as well. So that's the process we're going through. Joe.
Well, we've all been united. So all of the elected officials who represent that area, uh, Congressman Jerry Nadler, Borough President Gail Brewer, State Senator Brad Hoylman, Assemblymember Dick Gottfried, and myself have all been united. We have done these meetings together. We have worked in a working group fashion together as elected officials, and there are some pretty serious concerns. We want a, we wanted a uh, working group in place with um, NYCHA, the deputy mayor's office, the administration, the elected officials, tenants from the Fulton houses, and other folks uh, who have expertise on this issue because there are concerns about uh, demolition, very serious concerns. There are concerns about RAD and uh, what RAD would mean in this instance, and we want to work through those concerns. Uh, so um, I, I read Sally's story. Sally has very good sources, uh, uh, and you know we're going to continue to see where we can go. But you know the, you know the elected officials are united. We are together in this, and we are not going to be bulldozed. Uh, we are not trying to you know, throw up stumbling blocks. We're trying to work through this in a community-based way where the tenants are listened to. That's what we want. We were trying to set up a structure where the tenants could be listened to, and it's not the elected officials making the decisions for the tenants. We would work with the tenant leaders. We would work with the tenants to understand what they want at their development. Their voices really matter in this, and that is what you've seen the elected officials talk about over and over and over again, and we're gonna continue to say that. We're gonna see where this ends up, but uh, at this point, there are still a lot of outstanding questions that we don't feel comfortable with yet. I'm open to it. I, I don't have a problem. I mean, I think that, uh, you know, the more people that want to come in and talk about the importance of this issue, that's fine with me. It's not, to me, it's not a, a territorial. Uh, you know, if they wanted to come participate in these meetings, I would have no problem with it. Thank you.